Welcome to another episode of Software Explorations Concept and Overviews hosted by your truly tech coach Ralph, where we're in June Twin. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about microservices. I wanted to get a better understanding of it and I wanted to share it with you. But before we get into our presentation, do me a big, big favor. If you haven't done so already, like the video, share the video, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell so you know every time that we go live. And, and if you need additional content, exclusive content that is not on YouTube, go to www.techcoachralph.dev where you can get access to our latest sprint reviews. You can get access to our full scrum night as well as sign up for one-on-one -on -one coaching with me if you need it. All right. But with that being said, let's jump into our presentation on microservices. All right. So modern software development microservices architecture. Our agenda for today is we're going to get an intro into microservices. We're going to talk about the key concepts and principles, the advantages of using microservices, the challenges of using microservices, we're going to compare microservices to a monolithic approach, and then we're going to talk about the tools and technologies included in microservices, and then we're going to look at some case studies, and then we're going to wrap it up with our conclusion. All right, so let's jump into it. So intro to microservices. What We're going to talk about what are microservices, the evolution from monolithic to microservices, and then we're going to talk about the, import, the importance of modern software development. So what exactly are microservices? Microservices are in an architectural approach where an application is divided into small self-contained services, each responsible for a specific business function. So it's not like everything is in one application. We're going to be breaking it up into very small, specific pieces of functionality. And then we're going to be use those accordingly and we're going to connect them to one another. So, um, and, and we'll, we'll get into that a, little, a lot more as we go through, right? These services operate independently, allowing for easier development, deployment, and scaling. Communication between microservices occurred through APIs, enabling flexibility and technology diversity within the system. So let's break it down a little bit, right? So microservices have a decoupled architecture. So microservices are small, independent services that work together to form a larger application. Each service is self-contained and handles a specific business function. And you'll see as we get into our case studies, you'll see you'll get a better understanding of how that actually works, right? They also have independent deployment. Each microservice can be de developed, deployed, and scaled independently, allowing for more agile and flexible updates. So pretty much you can you build them in separate pieces and then they come together at the end. So it's not like everything is dependent on one another. They have like their, all, their own individual functionality and then you, you combine them together. They also communicate via APIs. Microservices communicate with each other through well-defined APIs, often using HTTP slash REST APIs, uh, messaging um, queues, and gRPC. So if, if you remember as well, like when we went through our API, our API study, and through that presentation, we're looking at like how the different API calls, post, get, put, patch, etc., and how how those so, so the microservices are, are using those those api calls to interact with one another right it's also technology agnostic different microservices can be built using different programming languages frameworks and databases as long as they adhere to the agreed communication protocols so when we spoke about api contracts so each microservice is going to have its own api contract to know how to interact with another microservice so let's talk about the monolithic ver, um to microservice so Monolithic used to be where it was at, and then uh, now we're we're moving more towards uh, microservices, right? So, what is the challenge? With the we're going to talk about the challenge with the monolithic challenge, uh, the need for scalability, and agility, rise of microservices, adoption of cloud uh, of uh, cloud and DevOps. So, what's the challenge between the mono the monolithic challenge, right? So. Or what is the monolithic challenge? In a monolithic architecture, all components of an application are tightly coupled and run as a single unit. As applications grew more complex, this structure became harder to maintain, scale, and deploy. And so basically what this is saying is, in a monolithic architecture, everything is together, everything is in one big service, right? So if you have, let's say you have a backend and a fronting component, you have to deploy the, the backend if you're going to be making a front end change and vice versa, where you know, you might not necessarily want to do that, so you try to keep them independently. So so that's part of the the monolithic challenge, right? Even small changes required to redeploying the entire application, leading to a longer development cycle and increased risk of downtime. So that's exactly what I what I just said. So scalability and agility, right? So as demand for faster development and deployment cycles increase, business needed a more flexible approach. Monolithic architecture struggle with scaling specific components independently, leading to inefficiencies and bottlenecks. So an example of that is let's say you ha let's say everything is in one application, your database, your your backend, your front end, and 
let's say the database can handle a bunch of of api uh, or a bunch of, of requests being made right but your back end it can't take it so if you want to scale out the back end to to be have like more servers and stuff like that you'd have to do that for the entire application versus being able to say all right for the back end i, I want to get more servers but for the database i don't need that many more servers for the front end, we don't need that many more servers all right so so that's the scalability part so here comes the rise of microservices, right? So to address these challenges, the microservices architecture was introduced. This approach decomposes the monolithic application into smaller independent services, each focusing on a specific business capability. These services can be de developed, deployed, and scaled independently, allowing for greater agility, scalability, and resilience. So basically, we look at the different parts of the monolithic architecture and we say, all right, what parts can we pick out of it, right? We're going to turn this part into its own service. We're going to turn that part into its own service. We're going to get this part into its own service, give it the necessary APIs to make them communicate with one another, but they can still be ran independently of one of, of each other. So adoption of cloud and DevOps. Widespread adoption of cloud computing and DevOps practices further accelerated the shift to microservices. Cloud platforms offered the, ne the necessary infrastructure to manage and scale microservices effectively, while DevOps practices provided the tools and methodologies to handle the complexity of managing multi-services. Multi so if you ever, if you had followed along in our Terraform um, series on Sundays, our live streams, when we were when we were when we were setting up um, Elastic Cloud con um, Elastic Cl uh, Elastic Container Service on AWS, we were like you, you. This is where we could actually set up a microservice using Docker containers, where we could have different services running on different ports and have them communicate with one another. So as we go to uh, as we go to to turn a project that I'm working on into an actual microservice. Right now we're separating the back end from the front end. We're going to be deploying that most likely on either maybe Azure, maybe on 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 Google Cloud Platform, um, probably on AWS, so that we can set up a microservice architecture that way using Elastic uh, Elastic Container Services or with the equivalent to Azure and or or Google Cloud Platform, so that we can we can set it up as a microservice instead of right now it's running at as a monolithic application in um in uh, elastic beanstalk all right so what about modern software development so with modern software development it allows you to go to faster time to market how is that possible so when you're working in a, in a monolithic environment it's all one team they're divided into different parts of the application but like once a deployment happens everything has to be deployed but with modern software development with microservices you can have like let's say let's say there's five components to your to your to your entire service so you can have like so so each of those five is a microservice and you can have a separate team working on each of those in parallel so that now once everything comes together based upon the agreed upon apis now something that could take you like let's say it would take you like uh like five months to get it done you could actually get it done in maybe like uh, in like um like five weeks if you have each team working in parallel to which allows you to get to market faster you know scalability and flexibility so now for each service you can you can allocate the, the amount the correct amount of te technological resources so if you need this many servers if you need this many databases if you need this much memory it can be independent per, um, based on the on the actual service on the based on that microservice right so it has collaboration like i was saying you can take you can take one application that will take a long time you break it down and now you have different teams working on different parts that, that allow you to get to market a lot faster and then uh, improved quality and reliability so the same way you have those five teams for those five services you have uh, you have tests for each different service so you so you make sure that it the test runs a lot better and and, and the, the application is a lot more reliable because you have uh, you have tests for each application instead of trying to get tests for one big thing so let's get into the key concepts and principles of microservices, right? So decoupl decoupling and mod modularization, single responsibility principle, API-driven communication, autonomy and independence. So let's get into decoupling, right? What's the, what's the definition of decoupling? So decoupling in microservices refers to separate uh, to separating different parts of a system so that they operate independently. Each microservice functions as a well-contained unit with its own logic, data, and dependencies, minimizing its re reliance on other services. So everything is separate from each other. It's um, we don't want we don't want any dependencies between the services. So that is so that's how we we separate them so that they can run uh, independently. So that's what it means to be decoupled. What, now, what's the importance of, of decoupling? This separation allows each service to be developed, deployed, and scaled independently. So they're all on their own. They're not relying on, on one another. It reduces the impact of changes or failures in one service on the rest of the system, leading to more robust and resilient applications. So if 
one part of the application, if one one service goes down, the other service should not have to go down. So it, it should be able to keep chugging chugging along, all right? So and so whether whether a service goes down or comes up, it should still be good. Like the other five, the other if we're using the example of five, the other four should still be fine. How about modularization, right? So the definition of modularization involves breaking down an in, in application into smaller manageable and reusable modules, each responsible for a specific functionality. In microservices, each module corresponds to an individual microservice that can be developed and maintained independently. Very, very similar, very similar to decoupling. The importance of modularization is it promotes code re reusability, easier maintenance, and better organization of the application's code base. It enables teams to focus on specific features or components, improving productivity and reducing complexity in the development process. So what are some advantages to microservices, right? So like we mentioned, it's scalable, flexible in the technology stack, uh, faster development and deployment, resilient and fault um, isolation. So scalability, independent scaling, like I was mentioning earlier, you can allocate the, the right amount of resources for each microservice, whether you need to, whether you need to have this much CPU power, whether you need to have this much, um, this much memory, uh, whether you need to have this much disk space, whatever, however many databases, targeted resource al um, allocation, like I was just mentioning, uh, elastic scaling with cloud. So let's say you're, let's say I, I use AWS a lot. So let's say you're saying, all right, um, this, if, if it reaches this particular threshold of memory usage, then let's add more memory automatically. If it, if it reaches this much, um, CPU, so just add this much CPU automatically. Right. And then, um, fault isolation and resilience. So if something happens, happens on, on the microservice that say that some type of error happens if, if that microservice goes down it shouldn't affect the other ones as well like so it, so it should be able to uh so, so it should be able to pr protect it from other microservices as well as other microservices protected from it as well so the technology stack flexibility one of the great things about microservices is that it 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 has that best for the job mindset right so if an example, let's say you have an you have a front end, you have a, a back end API. Let's say it would be better to use Python and Fast API to build the API. Um, and for the front end, it would be better to use to use Node, right? So you can you can totally have one team building in, in Python for the API, and then you have a, another team building in in Node for the for the front end in, in Node.js and Express and things like that. And now, based on the APIs that are, the the APIs that are exposed for the back end, it can easily connect to it. They don't even care; like it doesn't even matter what language each is written in. With the monolithic approach, it would matter, right? It, so if you're doing the code base in this, then everything else has to follow along, which which would make it like really tough uh, because it's not always like the best tool for the job, right? So innovation and experiment. So you're able to try different things out, try different code bases out, see what works, see what we see what doesn't work. And other teams are not affected. They're able to work independently. Uh, it reduces technical debt because you don't accumulate this huge, huge backlog of, of things that need to be fixed based on the front end, based on the back end, based on the database, based on who knows what, right? There's team autonomy. So um, team Team A, B, C, D, and E. They can be working on their own things. They and, and they just they communicate. They have the API contracts, but they're not they're not highly reliant on uh, what one team is doing to be able to be blocked or unblocked, right? And then resilience to failure. So, like I was saying earlier, if if something fails here, it doesn't affect it on the other hand, right? So, very very important stuff. And then faster de development and deployment it allows par parallel deployment. So like I was saying, if you like compared building one at one monolithic application, uh, which could take you five months, if you can break it down to five different teams, getting it done in five weeks, right? So very, you get to fast, you get to market a lot faster, which means you start making money a lot faster as well, right? Smaller code bases. So you don't have this one huge code base that you're trying to get everything stuffed in. It's, it's very small and independent and the independent deployments. So the same way, the same way with the, with the smaller code bases, you, you have these, you have, you're, you're deploying those code bases as well. So uh, they're not relying on one another. You get, uh, and you get to, you can have one team working on one thing, another team working on another thing, totally independent. Continuous delivery and integration. So you set up your CI CD pipelines as we, as we spoke about before, and you have things like working a lot smoothly. You have things a lot smaller. You have your tests running independently as well, which which leads you to reduce risk of failures, which is very, very important. Like we, we just don't want to fail in these type of things. Right? So resi resilience and fault isolation. So fault isolation, like we were saying, one, one thing does not affect the other, right? So, and, and that's what we're trying to prevent. We don't want the whole application to be brought down because of one little 
point of failure. So we try to separate those, we try to isolate those, right? So improved system resilience, what I was just saying, isolating the, the points of failure, easier debugging and recovery because you don't have such a huge code base, you can quickly identify what's causing the, part, the problem and you're able to look into that, fix that and not have the whole system affected by it. And then granular scaling and rollback. So you're able to, uh, with the resources, able to go up and go down as needed, based on that individual microservice. So you're not, you're not dependent, like you're not trying to add additional resources for the areas that it's not needed. So you're, be, you're able to be very, very careful and be able to have great resource allocation. So let's get into the challenges of microservices. It is an increased complexity because you are separating, like it's the classical way of building everything in one application. You're separating that out. And then, and you're separating that out and you're trying to make it, um, you're trying to make them independent of one another when the, the classic way to go is like, just dump, just, just bundle everything together, right? You have network latency and reliability. So be, being that everything is its own service, they need to communicate with one another. If the network is going slow, if there's a disconnect on the network somewhere, then they're not going to be able to communicate, communicate with each other. Data management. So when you could probably just have one database back in the days, um, now you're going to, you, you, you're you going to have data coming into different services and how to you manage that data. You're going to have to be able to pull the data from whether you have one database or many database, you're going to have to pull that data into to each microservice on its own. Uh, the monitoring and debugging can be a little bit tricky because you have many different services that you're monitoring when before you just have one one application that you're doing all the monitoring for, which could be still a, a bit messy, but you see everything in one spot versus uh, versus monitoring a bunch of other spots, right? Deployment co um, complexity. So now you're, you're deploying five, five um, microservices versus one big application, which it has problems deploying that one big application, but you're also having to deploy five different applications and set up setting up five different CI/CD um, pipelines and builds and tests and things like that. It makes it a little bit more complicated. It, it gives you more services to secure versus where you could have focus on securing one service. Now you have to secure five different services, make sure that uh, intruders can't get into five different spots versus one spot. And then team coordination, there's going to be API contracts that are needed. You're going to have to communicate very well, uh, having good documentation because the, the team is like, although they're not reliant on your service being um, fully developed or completed up or down, they still need to, they still need to, to code based on the, expect, the expected contract, the expected API contract. So you have to get that out clearly and early and things like that. So coordinating it can be a bit, a bit tricky. And then cost management, based on how you scale, based on uh, the servers that you have, it could be costly, but if you do it the right way, you should be able to keep your costs down and, and efficient. So let's talk about the monolithic applications for a second, right? So microservices differ from, from monolithic applications in their arch architectural approach and operational characteristics. In a monolithic application, all components are tightly integrated into a single unified system, meaning the entire application must be deployed and scaled as a whole. This can lead to challenges in maintaining, maintaining scaling and updating the application as even small changes require redeploying the entire system. In contrast, microservices Architecture um, breaks down the application into smaller independent services, each, each responsible for specific business functions. These services can be de uh, developed, deployed, and scaled independently, allowing for greater flexibility, faster development cycles, and easier for isolation. While monolithic architectures offer simplicity and ease in initial development, or um, initial development, microservices provide enhanced scal um, scalability, resilience, and adaptability, making them better suited for complex, evolving applications. You know, so... Like I was saying, it, it does it does look easier to just bundle everything together, right? But once you start separating them, you see a lot more value in the way that you manage your resources. Especially, especially, what if your app blows up, right? If your app blows up, then you don't want to have you don't want to have a monolithic application because now you have to do a, a bunch of rework. Which is actually, what I'm doing right now, I'm re like before we go any further in the in, in our codes application, we are turning it into a microservice so that we can so that we can separate it and we can have. Um, so when we go forward, like as we add user management and different features, we can have it have our own microservices for the user. We have our own microservices for the quotes dealer. We have our own microservices for the front end, you know. So and then as we add as we add other front ends as well, that can be its own microservice where where it's pulling in it's pulling in quotes based on a, a different a different a different author. So what are some of the tools and technologies used for microservices? So container and orchestration. So Docker, Kubernetes. I can't wait for us to get into Kubernetes on our on Sundays on our DevOps series. Uh, and then we have um, service discovery and load balancing. So console, Eureka, Nginx, so that so that um, you're able to scale and you're able to to see see like how much resources that you need. There's API gateway. So there's Kong. There's API gateway with AWS. Uh, there's monitoring and debugging, so there's REST, uh, G, uh, GRPC, message brokers. 
For data management, there's Postgres, MySQL, Mongo, Cassandra. Uh, for monitoring and logging, there's Prometheus, there's Elkstack, there's uh, Grafana, uh, CI/CD, there's Jenkins, Circle CI, GitLab, TeamCity, um, Spinnaker, uh, tons of them, right? In the security, there's OAuth2, OpenOI Connect, there's ISTIO, there's Sync, so many different security tools as well. So let's get into some case studies before we wrap this up, right? So there's some there's case studies about Netflix, Amazon, Uber, Spotify, eBay, but we're just gonna couple, we're just gonna tackle like three of them, right? So let's get into it. So Amazon, what was the challenge that Amazon faced? So Amazon's early e-commerce platform was built on a monolith, uh, on a monolith, which led to difficulties in scaling and slowed down the release of new features as an, as the platform grew. And we we see how quickly Amazon grew th um, throughout the years. So what was the solution that Amazon came up with? Amazon decomposed its monolithic application into microservices where each service was responsible for a specific business function, such as payment processing, inventory management, and user authentication. They also implemented a service-oriented architecture, SOA, to enable these microservices to communicate effectively. So what was the outcome of Amazon's microservice uh, migration, right? Amazon was able to scale different parts of its platform independently, significantly improving performance and enabling faster innovation. This architecture also allowed uh, Amazon Web Services, AWS, to emerge as a leader in cloud computing by offering similar microservices capabilities to internal customers. So, and here's the cool thing about Amazon. It's one of the reasons I love Amazon, right? They had a problem. They found a way to fix it. And then based on how they fixed it, they were able to offer it to other people to be able to, to replicate that and fix their own problems, you know? So let's get into Uber now. What, what challenges did Uber face? So Uber initially operated as a monolithic architecture that struggled to handle rapid growth in, in user base. Global expansion and the increasing complexity of their services, such as a, a ride hailing, food delivery, and freight logistics. How did they solve this problem, right? So Uber adopted a microservice architecture to, couple, to decouple its services, allowing them to scale independently and manage the complex interactions between various components like ride, ride, rider matching, payment processing, and route opt optimization. So what was the outcome of, of this, right? So Uber's transition to microservices enabled them to improve system reliability, scale their operations globally, and add new services more rapidly. It also helped them manage their diverse and growing set of offerings more efficiently. And lastly, let's get into Spotify, right? So what challenges did Spotify um, face? Spotify faced challenges in scaling their platform as they expanded globally, especially in handling features like music streaming, user recommendations, and playlist management. So what does Spotify do? So Spotify adopted a microservice architecture where each service such as playlist management or user, man user recommendations was managed by small autonomous teams called squads. And he, at my company, we call it we call them squads. Like we, I work on a squad. These squads were responsible for the entire lifecycle of their service from development to deployment. Exactly, exactly how we work here. So Spotify outcome. Uh, so Spotify achieved faster release cycles, better scalability, and greater innovation. The microservices approach also supported their agile development processes, enabling small teams to operate independently and contribute to the overall platform success. All right, so that is everything for microservices. Let's run through what we spoke about. We, we went through the intro to microservices. We spoke about the key concepts and principles, the advantages uh, the, of microservices, the challenges of dealing with microservices, and we compared microservices to a monolithic approach. We talked about the tools uh, and technology, which is many, many tools, many, many technologies, very, very important to learn at any, in anything in tech you do, I would suggest learning those, the different tools and technologies. And then we spoke about some case studies from, from Uber, from Amazon, from from, from Spotify. So that leads us to, if you have any questions, if you have any feedback, if you think I should touch on this a little bit more, if there's anything that you, more that you'd like to know about microservices, please let me know. Drop me a comment and I will be happy, happy, happy to respond to you. All right. Um, but I'm you're very curious. What did you think about this? Uh, did you find it helpful? Did you find it informative? Is there more that you want? Is, am I missing something? Did I, did I give too much? Let me know your thoughts. I'm very, very happy to make a follow-up video so that this can be a lot clearer to you. All right. So we're going to go back to full screen before we wrap this up. All right. I just want to say thank you guys for tuning in. I hope that this brought a lot of value to you. I hope that it was very helpful and informative. Let me know your thoughts. Let me know if there is anything more that I can do to make this easier to understand. So like, it's just recently that I started learning about microservices. It, it turns out that um, they, they use it at, at the company that I work for. And I didn't 
like I would always hear it, but I didn't necessarily understand exactly what they were talking about until I until I I did this research here. I started doing doing the DevOps course, learning more about microservices, and it makes total total sense now. Like when I'm looking through our AWS, I'm like okay, this now I understand everything that, that we're talking about. So and this is the importance of doing this type of research and getting a getting more educated so that as you as you approach the market, as you approach the field, you can be more confident. You can say, oh, at least I have exposure to this. Um, but we're definitely going to be um setting up microservices on our Sunday live streams as we go through our DevOps. So you definitely want to tune in there. And that's, that's why I ask you for the big, big favor of liking the video, sharing the video, subscribing to the sh channel above all else, subscribe to the channel, share it with a friend uh, who is like, who's in tech, who's not in tech, who, who might be interested in tech, help them grow. Uh, and let's just help each other out, all right? And lastly, as we wrap it up, uh, once again, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for tuning in. Go over to techcoachdrop.dev and you can sign up there for free. Get access to the sprint reviews that we do, that I do with the tech barbarians, uh, where you see like the type of questions that we ask. We see how, like what we just finished working on for the past two weeks. I am happy to share that with you. With an elevated membership, you will also get you will also get access to the full scrum night as well as exclusive content that I do not put on YouTube about like. Um, how to set up your resume, access to seeing me update my resume, which, I, which I'm going to be doing soon live, uh, updating my resume. Um, to also access to also access to uh, um, the different uh, different job searching techniques, things like that. And if you need one on one coaching, that is the place to sign up as well, where there's different tiers for coaching, where we can work uh, together for a, a little bit of time, where we can work together for a lot of time during the month and you get plugged into the to the coaching group and uh, we can work together to help you get to the next step. All right. So that is techcoachrap.dev sign up for there you can sign up for free get get information that you will not see on youtube ever so let's do that let's run it up like, like we all, like i always like to say right we're tech savages or engineer to win there are no days off we are going to run it up all right with that being said this is tech coach Ralph. i'm gonna get out of here thank you guys for tuning in have a wonderful wonderful rest of your wednesday the rest of your week see you tomorrow on the live stream <laughs>